located in good places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here in Israel on this conference. <sighs> Probably many of you remember how did you deploy uh, services and applications 10 may or maybe even five years ago. So your company had a server room somewhere, maybe in the basement, maybe in some shared location, or maybe it, the company was big enough at the designated data center. And there were servers, many of them, from different vendors with different operating system in various versions. And there was uh, this poor administrative guy in the middle trying to handle everything. Getting the new machine was taking ages. It could have been weeks from the time you asked for one to the time when it was finally up and running. Then you, or this sysadmin, had to go in log in and install all of the uh, runtime environments, uh, dependencies, databases, monitoring stuff on the machine. If you were lucky, you had some scripts to automate it, I don't know, Chef, uh, Puppet, whatever, but many times you had to do lots of things manually. It was a nightmare. A couple years ago, the cloud revolution happened. People noticed that cloud can give significant savings, both in terms of time and money. You, you can get the machine you want at the location you need uh, with uh, the expected uh, operating system with, uh, within minutes, with just a couple of mouse clicks. And usually running on cloud can be also cost effective. You don't have to pay $10,000 upfront for the servers. You can pay as you go, only for the time the machine is up and running. Cloud companies obviously make money on you, but on the other hand, they, have, uh, they can negotiate much better deals with cheap manufacturers. They have uh, very sophisticated uh, power supplies, coolings, they have diesel generator to survive power outages. So going to cloud is a win-win situation. But is going to cloud solve all of your problems? No, you get your machine, you get it fast but you still need to log in and install and configure stuff. At Google, we noticed this problem long time ago. We operate at a massive scale. We have hundreds of thousands of machines, and with this scale, we cannot our allow ourselves to go to every single machine and install application. The installation process must be smooth and <laughs> effective and simple, so that we introduce containers. For those of you who have never heard about containers, there is something in between a very lightweight version of a virtual ma machine and a well-isolated process. A container doesn't have a full operating system. It doesn't try to emulate a uh, different environment. Instead, it provides you with an isolation. It isolates uh, your application from the operating system and multiple uh, containers from each other so then they don't interfere. Contains all, uh, containers also contain all of the binaries and dependencies for your application. Google have been using containers for the last 12 years. In fact, everything at Google runs in a container. We've been running about 2 billion containers per week. We thought that containers were such a good idea that everyone should use it. So in the past, we open sourced the key building blocks for containers, like C groups, so that others could use them as well. And the technology eventually got adopted. In 2013, the first version of Docker was released and immediately got uh, extremely popular. Docker provides you with super easy way to build your container images. It also gives you a runtime environment in which you can start your container with just a single command. Okay, so is problem of deployment solved? Not really. Do you remember this picture I showed you a minute ago? Yes, there are hundreds of machines. Where do you run your container? How do you check if it's still up and running or maybe has some problems? 
How do you connect it with some other container running on a completely different machine? How do you load balance the traffic? How do you do storage? At Google, we have a dedicated system that handles that. We've been building it for years. It's great, but on the other hand, it's also extremely complex and complicated and very tightly fitted to the way Google operates and writes its software, so it cannot be used by anyone else. So based on the experience from running containers, we built Kubernetes. What's it? Kubernetes is a uh, cluster manager on top of which you can easily build your heavily distributed and replicated application. Kubernetes it is an open source platform providing you container uh, centric infrastructure for automated deployment, scaling and operations. Okay, but how does it differ from Docker? What exactly does it provide? Well, Docker focuses mainly on running containers on a single machine. Kubernetes goes much further. It gives you higher level abstraction. To explain it, I'll use an example. So let's imagine that we are creating a website with a celebrity-related news and gossips. I don't know if you happen to have such a thing in Israel, but here is what it looks like in Poland. It has a lot of pictures and news crucial to the future of mankind, like this one. Justin Bieber has just landed in Krakow, my home city. <laughs> when building such a website, you often need to run containers together. For example, a container that pulls this Justin, Justin Bieber photos from some central repository and a container with a web server that serves these images to the end user. They need to run on the same machine. There is little point on fetching the, machine, uh, the images on one machine and serving them from the other. Such a tightly coupled group of containers that are run together, they, they share the same IP address, this, they share the same volumes, is called a pod. It's the main concept of Kubernetes and a basic scheduling unit. When you create a pod in Kubernetes, the Kubernetes uh, master goes through all of your nodes in the cluster and tries to find the best place for it to run. So you don't have to choose the machine manually. Okay, so is one image serving pod uh, enough? Probably not. Your site can be pretty popular, so you need many of them, maybe 10. Replica set is responsible for keeping the given number of uh, pods up and running. If one of the pod dies or the machine that hosts it crashes, the another pod is started immediately, so you always have your 10 pods up and running. Okay, let's continue. Is 10 replicas uh, the right number? Well, it depends. Sometimes the only news you have is that Justin Bieber ate an omelet for the breakfast, and then the traffic is small. You'd need less pods and less machines to run your site. But on the other hand, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt divorce and bank, the traffic skyrockets, and you need much more machine and pods to handle the traffic. So, Kubernetes provides you with an automatic, horizontal, pod and node scaling so to adjust the number of uh, pods and machines to your current needs. So, if you are running on the cloud, you pay only for the capacity you need and when this spike comes, you are ready for it. The new machines will be added automatically. Let's go a step further. So you have variable number of frontends, variable number of backends. You have some microservices uh, there and elsewhere. Microservices are cool. And a MySQL database, all of them that can move from one place to another. How do you connect these things so that they talk to each other? Kubernetes does it automatically. It provides you with a concept of service. Service is a grouping that groups pods under a single IP addresses. It also gives you a DNS name, so you can easily talk to it from other uh, containers running in Kubernetes. From time to time, you roll out a new version of your uh, site. Maybe it's a complete redesign, or maybe it's just a pink version for Valentine's Day. And no matter whether you want to upgrade one machine or one, uh, one, one pod or 100 pod, Kubernetes can do it for you with a rolling update. 
you almost always store some user data. For example, in our site, that can be a discussion board where people are discussing the arrival of Justin Bieber to Krakow. <laughs> and with containers, the storage can be tricky, but Kubernetes also does it for you. It brings the concept of volume that is automatically mounted to the pod, wherever it is. So the problem is kind of solved for you. Last but not least, Kubernetes provides you with health checking, monitoring and logging. And with many more stuff. Okay, so we know how to build our site. We will use Kubernetes, we will use the main Kubernetes concepts. Uh, but where do we deploy it? Of course on the cloud. But choosing the right cloud can be hard. Many things look different on various cloud providers. Different deploying tools, different network configuration, different storage. Kubernetes tries to blur all of the differences. It provides you with common interfaces and objects that work more or less the same on all environments. So you are not locked to a single vendor. You can move. You can switch your cloud provider should the other one give you better performance for smaller money. And if you are still in your own data center, running your applications on bare metal, Kubernetes also helps you. You can have Kubernetes with most of the features that it provides. And when you will be ready to switch to cloud, you will be able to do it gradually, one application at a time. Okay, so where are we with this project? Kubernetes 1.0 was launched about one and a half year ago. And in December this year, we are planning to release the version 1.5. Our code base contains currently about 40,000 uh, commits from 950 different contributors. We are in the top 0.001% of GitHub projects, and about 250 external projects are based on Kubernetes. We have contributors from major companies like Huawei, Intel, IBM, Fujitsu, Red Hat, Hitachi, and all of these brave boys and girls are not doing it in their spell time, but rather as an official work assignment. And we have clients and users, lots of them, with big names like Yahoo, Box, eBay, Goldman Sachs, New York Times. And there is one special user I would like to talk a bit more. Last summer, the world got crazy about a game. People were running around the cities and countryside trying to find something with their mobile phones. Yeah, Pokemons. <laughs> so, <laughs> Pokemon Go runs on Kubernetes. Oh, okay. Oh. Something going on? Okay. <laughs> Pokemon Go, Go uh, uh, runs on Kubernetes in Google Cloud. And we share, and they recently shared some statistic about how their land went. So this graph approximates the user traffic. The pink, uh, the orange line is what they, ex uh, they expected to happen. The red one is their estimated worst case scenario, like five times bigger than uh, the initial estimate. And the green line is what actually happened. So as you can see, the traffic immediately skyrocketed and cloud and Kubernetes helped them to survive it along with their skyrocketing user base. Okay, so how it was all possible? So Kubernetes was open source from the very beginning. And by open source, we don't mean that the only source code is open. We open the whole development and decision process to the user. Currently, we host about 12 meetings on a weekly or bi-weekly week, uh, basis where we discuss various things with our community. These things vary from the very generic one to the very focus and specific one, like uh, scheduling, networking, on auto-scaling. And with the code, we went even one step further. With the release of 1.0, we donated the whole code to the newly created Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so that Google doesn't own the product. It's not a ruler. It cannot shut it down. 
In version 1.0, about 70% of, uh, of contributions were made by approximately 40 Googlers. Currently, the proportion looks different. Only 40% of contributions are made by the twice as big team. So we have a lot of con uh, other contributors. It's definitely a joint effort. Everyone is invited and it brings trust, adoptions and contributors to the projects. The second uh, important element behind the Kubernetes success is the Go programming language. Go is easy to learn, so you can uh, start writing meaningful uh, programs after just a couple days of playing with it. It's also easy to read, which is extremely important when you have to code review uh, stuff from people with different programming skills. It has built-in concurrency. And built-in concurrency is important because uh, Kubernetes has to handle thousands of servers and uh, tens of thousands of pods running of them. And it is important that the concurrency model in Go is very readable because, you, as I said, you do lots of code review from different person, different people. It has built-in garbage collector. <laughs> Collecting garbage can be extremely uh, tricky uh, in a very concurrent environment. That's one of the reasons why we didn't use C++ for the project. Go has simplified the library. There is usually one way of doing stuff. So it's easy to learn, it's easier also to code review, and it's easier to expect how the project is working. It has small and portable binaries, so that the Kubernetes footprint is smaller comparing to uh, Java or Scala. It doesn't have any extra dependencies. Everything is compiled statically, so you get just a single file to, uh, with your executor available. And last but not least, Docker and etcd are also uh, written in Go. etcd is a database that Kubernetes uses to store its state so that the integration with these key components were much easier with Go. Okay, where are we going with this project? The list of goals for 2017 is not yet finalized and will be probably too long to present here, so I will focus only on the uh, couple elements. Workloads. We need to focus on making Kubernetes a great place to run your application, but it's also, but we need also to make sure that the common tools like Spark, Kafka, or Cassandra work best there. They should not be just executable there. They should be fully integrated with Kubernetes and understand the environment they are running it, so they can operate in the best way. Kubernetes is secure. But in the world of big companies, there are usually quite complicated rules of who can do what. Of course, you can create a single cluster for each of your business units, but the resources will be better utilized if you have just a single cluster with proper authentication, authorization, and isolation, just as we do at Google. And the project that previously was bravely named Ubernetes, it's a Kubernetes on top of other Kubernetes clusters. With that, you can manage multiple Kubernetes clusters running on different cloud providers or on-prem from a single point. So you have pods, replicas, deployments on all of the abstractions that are available in regular Kubernetes in a bigger computing space. So you can move your pods easily from one data center to another. You can have multiple cloud providers or combine uh, your cloud and on-prem uh, data center in a single environment. We started this effort last summer, but we are hoping to push it much further next year. Okay, so that's the end. If I manage to interest you uh, anyhow, please visit kubernetes.io for more information.